This is Vicki Landers from Disability Pride PA. Hi, this is Esther Gillier from the Keith Firm Chapter of Solid Austin. And you're listening to White Canyon Connect. Hey there, Federationists. Welcome to another episode of White Canes Connect, presented by the National Federation of the Blind of Pennsylvania. My name is David Goldstein. I am the treasurer of the Keystone Chapter, and joining me today is co-host and Keystone Chapter Vice President Lisa Bryant. Lisa, how are you today? I am doing great, David. And thank you to Esther, our very own Esther Gilliard, our Keystone chapter member, introduced us to Vicki Landers. Vicki is founder and executive director of Disability Pride PA. Yeah, and Vicki is going to go over all of the things coming up for Disability Pride Week coming up in June. And she's got a lot of great things to say as far as that goes and all the cool events that are coming up, not only here in Philadelphia on that week, but around the state at other times of the year. Oh, let's take a listen. Vicki and Esther, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you for having me. And thank you, Esther, for bringing Vicky to our attention. Welcome to, to both of you. Vicki, um, you're founder and executive director of Disability Pride PA, so you would be great to start with the origins of how Disability Pride came about. Tell us that story. Sure. Um, so it started out um, the National Constitution Center was looking to add a piece of disability art or disability history into their center. Um, and they worked out an, um, an idea of getting the Justin Dart wheelchair, which is now there on display. Um, they wanted to have a party around it, um, which sparked the idea um, for disability pride events to start happening the following year. Um, my friend and mentor, Alan Holdsworth, um, was like, why don't we do this all the time? Why isn't it Disability Pride? And Disability Pride Philadelphia started, kicked off um, 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, started off as a very small little kind of parade around the National Constitution Center. Um, and then at each year we started to grow and grow. We started to add more events. We're now, we are now celebrate Disability Pride Week in Philadelphia, which is um, very exciting. And the council members all um, give us a proclamation for it. Um, but it is also a fun, you know, a fun week of disability pride. Yeah. So I want to back up a little bit. So you mentioned Justin and the wheelchair. Tell us about him and why is his name? Why should his name be more of a household uh, name oh. than it is? Sure. So Justin Dart, um, we call him the grandfather of the ADA. Mm -hmm. He was an integral part of getting the politicians and the um, community organizers together in the same room, having the conversations, making sure that the ADA was written, um, it, you know, that both parties um, were sitting together and doing this. He was a um, person who was a wheelchair user. Um, he was a really strong into politics, knew all of the people that needed to be known on that side. But he was also, him and his wife were very much huge um, community um, disability rights organizers and community members. Why is the event in June and not during Disability Pride Month, which is in July? So Disability Pride, uh, my my opinion on should be every, every day. Um, I don't really consider July Disability Pride Month, just because of the fact that in July is the um, anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, which I think should hold its own space um, because it is such a large piece of legislation that we are still fighting to have them um, uphold. Um, we at Disability Pride believe that Disability Pride should be celebrated every day. So it can be any time of year. Um, which we host four events across the state in di on different days. Um, but we hold here in, in Philadelphia, we hold this event 
in June because it goes back to our roots for the um, um, the Olmstead Act, which was an integral part of people being able to live their independent life and having the services in their homes so that they could be in the community. I was reading uh, a little bit about you know the origins and the the mission, and one thing that that struck me was the widening of the definition of uh, disability. Can you tell me more about that? What do you mean? What is a better way of defining disability? Well, we, we we're looking to just um, take the the definition that has been um, kind of put on us um, for so many years that disability is a bad thing, that it is, you know, it's, it's not a good word to use. People like to use other words than the word disability. So our thing is we are redefining it. This is disability is just, it's a natural part of society. We've been here since the beginning and just trying to get people to reimagine what disability means. Um, it does not mean what the textbook definition is of not able. Um, it, it Disability is just uh, an adaptive way of doing something. So in celebrating all of these abilities, we do have Disability Pride Week coming up. So let's talk about what is, uh, what's on the schedule. And I know that there are things in throughout the state, Philadelphia, I think I saw Lehigh Valley, Yes. So start starting with Philadelphia, take us, walk us through what's going on. And then Esther will bring you in and tell it. You can tell us what you're specifically going to be doing. But we'll start with Vicki kind of given the, the lay of the land. Sure. So Disability Pride Week um, is June 5th through the 11th. Um, the first thing that is really great is that on June 1st, um, Council Member Kendra Brooks um, we'll have the council um, proclaim that that is the week of that is going to be Disability Pride Week. Um, so that's very exciting. Yeah. Um, so then on June 5th um, at three o'clock, it's City Hall on the North Apron where the flagpole is. Um, we will raise the National Adapt flag, which is a uh, it's very important to me personally, but also I believe that it it shows our history. It shows where we where we've come from and the fight that has happened. And then also is kind of to me is a little kind of kick to like the work that still needs to be done. And so we're one of very few um, cities in the country that actually raises the national adapt flag over the city um, for the entire week. We were the first, which was very exciting, um, but people, you know, knew that it was a great thing and have started to do more of it. So we have a kickoff at three o'clock on at City Hall. We're having an ice cream giveaway. Ben and Jerry's is coming out, which is really great. I love their work. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll have um, guest speakers. Um, we'll have music by um, Johnny Crescendo, who has a song called Pride. That is the song that we sing after the flag goes up, um, the pole. Um, and then we'll just have kind of it's a, it's a time for us to just celebrate, get ourselves excited for the week to come. So I chuckled because I thought you were going to say you love Ben and Jerry's ice cream, but <laughs> you're much more professional than I am, Vicki. So <laughs> Love their ice cream. <laughs> you know, I love you their ice describe cream. Describe the the flag for those who may not be familiar with it. Sure. So the flag is is the um, the American flag, um, but in the blue square. So it's got the red and white stripes. The blue square in the corner. Um, instead of having um, all of the little stars in it, it's actually a. Um, wheelchair user who has his hands up over, has their hands up over their head and they're breaking chains. Oh, that's great. That's great. I, I, if it's okay, Vicki, I want to come back to why that is more personal to you. But Esther, uh, our own very own Esther from the Keystone chapter, wh- how, tell us how you became involved with Disability Pride and what are you doing that week? 
Um, well, I got involved through um, Matt uh, Berwick, um, who was at our state convention last year, um, because I was talking about me being a part of the Miss Blind Diva um, pageant. And he felt that um, that I should meet a super diva, awesome woman named Vicky Lander. <laughs> and so um, that's how I got involved. Um, and we came up with trying to get um, the National Federation of uh, Pennsylvania involved. Um, and that's why I'm really excited about participating in the committee um, and as well as performing. My first very um, first performance on um, June 10th <laughs> with an actual live band um, mm-hmm. called The First Room. So I'm super excited about this. So say that again. When exactly are you performing? Because I know we've got some locals that want to make sure they're there. Yes, June 10th. So, Vicki, why is the flag raising a more personal thing for you? Um, well, I, I am an advocate. Um, you know, it's, um, I believe that for me, pride, having pride, having, being proud of yourself and who you are, you advocate for yourself. Yeah. Um, and as you advocate for yourself and start to be more comfortable in your rights and learning those rights through the disability rights movement and adapt who that is the national that's the flag that we're that we raise mm-hmm. um you know leads lead you to advocate for others and then we're advocating for our community um because something that might help me might help somebody else so i find it to me it's really important that we remember where we came from yeah um and remember the fight that people have people are i mean today we have our ADAPT um, leaders in Washington, D.C., marching um, for healthcare workers to get better pay. Mm-hmm. You know, and our, that, that includes, you know, our, our aides, our attendants and, the, and those things. So to me, it, it reminds us of our history, of our brilliant past of coming, of all of us coming together to to you know, get the ADA signed Mm -hmm. and then the work that we, that has been done afterwards and the work that still needs to continue. So it's like kind of that jump, like that call to action. Yeah. And things kick off in Philadelphia, I believe Philadelphia, the, 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 uh, events start in Philadelphia and then go from where to where, uh, they start in Philadelphia. Um, the actual Disability Pride Philadelphia Parade and Festival is on June 10th, where you'll see Esther. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we will jump to July 22nd, which will be at, in Lehigh Valley, um, doing Disability Pride Lehigh Valley um, at the Penn State Lehigh Valley campus. And then we jump into August. Um, we're doing a Disability Weekend under the tent. Uh, where we've partnered with another organization to do a Friday, Saturday event in Pittsburgh on August 25th and 26th. And then we jump to October, October 7th, which will be Disability Pride Capital Region. And we'll be taking over the area uh, at the Capitol itself in Harrisburg. And like in Philadelphia, there'll be live entertainment, like the events will kind of look similar. Yeah. So I tell everybody, I'm like communities and, you know, even the four cities that I'm talking about, they all look very different. So we go in. So what I do, Disability Pride PA does is we go in, we're like, these are the basics that need to happen. What else do we want to do? So like here in Philadelphia, I always tell everybody, I tell all the other groups, I'm like, here in Philadelphia, I'm from Philly. I'm a true Philly girl. I, we want a party. We want it to be loud. We want there to be lots of stuff. Like that's what we want in Pittsburgh. It's very much, it's a day of advocacy. Um, but also, you know, there's live entertainment, but we do a lot, you know, it's very much, um, based as like a community fair, Mm -hmm. you know, in, in, in Harrisburg last year, 
Um, we did it during the week, during the day, because we wanted to have conversations with the folks who were actually in, actually there in Harrisburg that day, which were all of the folks. It was a day where everybody had to be in Harrisburg. Um, so it was, you know, it was kind of a informational fair, but we still mm-hmm. had music. We still had food trucks, you know. Mm-hmm. So those are kind of the basics. Always total access because that's what pulls us. That's what makes us different than most of the other events that ever happen is that we think about access first. And then we have disabled performers who are performing on stage because it's a day that everybody is welcome to come. It's open to the public. It's free, but we want to highlight the disability community during that day. And I noticed that um, as you speak about the work, you say we, and I noticed that something else on the uh, site said that you involve, there's an intention to have people from the disability community involved in forming the work that you do. So tell us more about that. Does that um, mean uh, uh, predominantly the staff are are predominantly people in the disabled community? The board is how do, how does, how do you, kind of live that out? Um, So, yeah, so the, all of our work revolves around our community Um, and these events that we put on are community events. So the community, we want the community to come in and have a voice in the way that it looks. Our board members, our staff members are all folks who have lived experience as, as a disabled person. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, we not only live within our community, but we're also working in our community. Um, And that just is, you know, it's a beautiful thing. (laughs) Um, So we're so that's that's super important to us. Um, And this started out like Disability Pride Philadelphia started out as this little group of folks from the community who were like, how do we do this? It grew into a nonprofit five years ago when I said, well, we need to be able to do more. We need to be able to do more than just a day. We need to do more than just, you know, this, what else can we do? So we made it a nonprofit, but still with the goal that we would be doing community events. So I am sure that that whole creating a nonprofit I mean, it's you're on the other side of it now, but tell us a little bit about what that was like. Was that a slow moving thing? Was it hard? Were you, did you feel like you were constantly battling uphill? Yes. Starting a nonprofit, <laughs> starting a nonprofit um, is incredibly tough, yeah. um, especially for um, folks who have no money backing. Um, which we did not, we, first, we raise the funds to hold these events. We don't, we're there. We have no big backers. We don't have any, um, you know, foundation money or any of that stuff. So we had to raise the money to actually pay to like turn in the IRS paperwork <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> to become a nonprofit. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the nonprofit paperwork for the IRS, which is not accessible, I will tell you, um, is like 40 something pages. And it, it's a lot for somebody who's never, so, you know, there's an easy way you hire somebody and they go and do it, but we want, we didn't have that kind of money. Mm -hmm. Um, and we also wanted to have our own hands in it. So that way we knew what it was. It, it, I think it's made us stronger because we've had to take every step. But we are, you know, so excited <laughs> when, when we finally got our papers. And it has been a struggle since then. Just, you know, nonprofit rules, um, the things that need to be done. Those are all, it's still a learning curve as a little nonprofit. Um, but it is worth every second. Um, and I can't imagine doing anything else. Is this your full time? Is this a full time job for you? I'm not considered full time. I do this out of love. <laughs> okay. 
So I, this is my life. I am a person with a disability, with multiple disabilities. So depending on my, um, how my body dis- decides it wants to be, depends mm-hmm. on how much work I can get done. So I always tell people, I, I just, this is, I live this. Mm-hmm. Um, I do what has to be done when it has to be done. And I try and take the dedicated breaks when my body says no. Esther, I wonder hearing all of this, um, cause I know this is your first time teaming up with this, um, organization, any thoughts of, uh, perhaps getting involved in the other locations or just how, how do you see your work with them sort of extending beyond the, um, June 10th performance? Uh, I would say definitely doing more at work, um, because, um, that is something like Vicki talked about that this is her life. This is my life too, you know, and as a blind person or who considered himself a blind person, who's visual care, um, the difficulties and the stigmas that are out there is something that we have to continue to um, break um, mm-hmm. and continue to voice our story. And get the world to kind of see our view that is not just our view, but it's technically everyone's view. Because if you wear glasses, you're playing free vision in here too. Um, and I think it's beautiful that um, talking about the, the, the flag, um, trying to break those barriers and showing the world that you know, our disability is not something um, to be frowned upon, that it's just another way of life. Um, and I think this is a great opportunity to just do that and, and also be fabulous about it. Be fabulous about it, yeah. <laughs> Why not, right? <laughs> so, yeah. um, again, going back to, you know, where all of the events are happening, are there events internationally as well? Yes, there are. There are. Disability Pride has become a movement within itself, mm-hmm. um, and there are disability pride bo- disability pride events happening all over the world. Um, during, during the same time frame? Nope. Again, they do them when it, you know across the world. They don't recognize Disability Pride Month as much as they do here because of here it was kind of started because of the ADA. Um, in in other parts of the parts of the world um they do them in at different time frames um i've i've i have friends um i've mentored um some folks who who wanted to start one in their areas um i'm totally on board with whatever folks need to help to make to do it in their area our my our goal at disability pride pa is to make Pennsylvania disability proud. Mm -hmm. Um, We don't want to, like my goal isn't, our goal isn't to run every event (laughs) that happens. Our goal is to give, give guidance when it's needed, help people get them up, up and running on their own and take them over, um, you know, and then be able to do some of this out, you know, this outreach to these other folks who are looking for answers or what do I do? How does this work? You know, and being able to be that somebody that they can talk to about getting them started. Mm -hmm. So that's a good way in good segue into my next question. So this is not just about the pride week and the fun. That's great. But the work is year round every day. So tell us more about, I know one, one of the things that I, I read about the goal is really tackling that self shame. So starting with people who do identify as, as as disabled, getting them more confident, getting them to view themselves differently. Um, that's part of the work. So tell us tell us about that. How do you how do you help change those mindsets? What resources or programs do you provide that address that? So, so for us, um, we've done, we've hosted a plethora of, of, of diff- different kinds of events. 
um, whether they're just socials, because people need to, I think social, to me, social engagement is, is where you're going to bring community together. And when you bring community together in social ways, um, you start to really impact um, your community and the conversations that your communities are having. Um, so having socials, we do workshops. We do workshops on um, disabled sex. We have conversations around um, disability art, all of these things that are very like disability centered, mm-hmm. but conversations that people need to hear that might not, they might not hear somewhere else. Um, and just kind of thinking outside the box. I don't, I think that there are a lot of organizations that do some really great work in what they're doing. A lot of times it's either partnering with them or just highlighting their work and getting more people to show up at their events, Mm -hmm. you know, or their workshops or their panels, whatever, you know, whatever, whatever that work is for me, we talk, I am, I personally, um, work on seven, seven different, um, committees or councils, um, talking about disability, um, getting that, getting that there's a lot of work being done in the DEI space. Yeah. Um, I have my own thoughts on that, but (laughs) one of the things I feel like we, I, we need to do is to make sure that we're, um, that the disability, that disability is actually included in the DEI work Mm -hmm. Um, because uh, there are so many spaces where I've come into a conversation and they haven't thought about disability. Right. Um, And then there there are, you know, there are lots of spaces that, that the work is really highlighted around, um, you know, the diversity and the and equity spaces and that just don't seem to understand that um, if you're doing inclusive work, you, you automatically are doing those two other things, <laughs> but inclusive work does include disability and access. How have you been able to work with businesses or even other agencies? How, like, what are you doing to that's another mindset. That's another, mm-hmm. that's another, um, you know, thing to tackle in terms of how people approach this work. Cause everyone is, you know, that DEI, like you're hearing that over and over and everywhere and everybody's so proud of their DEI work, but how have, what kind of conversations and efforts have you, um, been able to, it, I, I guess maybe this is a good time to tell us some success stories as well mm-hmm. as challenges in working mm-hmm. with businesses and other organizations to, to get that message across that the inclusion is just Mm -hmm. that (laughs) it's not, you know, just a a few segments of, of communities. Right. Yeah. So one of the things I really love is um, every year for the past, mm, I think it's four years now um, I have during October, which is nationally disability employment awareness Hmm. I think it is. Okay. Um, uh, I have I have a conversation with um, the Navy Yard here in Philadelphia, mm-hmm. um, which and I talk about disability etiquette, how to be a disability ally, um, and how to um, how to be more responsive to accommodations. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, that the fact that somebody may need an accommodation does not, should not um, make them not be able to, to, you know, have that position and how easy it is when you put your mindset into, into it, um, that really, <laughs> to me, everybody has accommodations, but there are legal accommodations that need to be done. Um, and that they're really not that difficult. And there's so many resources out there to help you figure out how that works. So that way you can be a more inclusive workforce. So that I really enjoy. We've had, I've had numerous conversations and I'm part of a, um, ideal committee 
for the Academy of Natural Sciences. And we are talk, we've talked a lot around disability. They have inside the building, they have some great access things that have worked really well. Um, it's actually a very inclusive place to come and visit, except for their front doors, which have steps, um, at which they are actually already have in the works to take that all out and make it so, so spectacular that it's going to be super inviting and not just like a ramp. Right. There's a way of doing it where it is inclusive for everybody to use um, and not just adding a ramp off the side. So okay. that's super, that's super exciting. That's that a success that's story. That's good. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. I can tell you that they are very interested. Uh, I've worked with a group to uh, they, they're interested in making the museum more enjoyable for folks who are blind and visually impaired to have an enjoyable day there uh, and learning how they could help those folks do that. We we mm -hmm. sat with them a few times so they can uh, gauge what they do to make it better. And And the fact that institutions like that are interested is more than half the battle. Yes. There's a whole wave of, of folks having conversations about museum type organizations or, you know, how they're, be, how, how to make them more accessible, how to make them feel not only accessible, but also how to make them feel like it's a place that we're going to see ourselves in. Mm -hmm. You know, cause that's another part of it that's what the national constitution center did, you know, 11 years ago was like, who are we missing? How do we make them feel like this is for them also? And that was the Justin Dart wheelchair display um, that, that, that how disability pride all got started. So that, that to me, was a huge success story moving in the right direction. And mm -hmm. they're super, you know, super accessible. They have all kinds of fun, sensory friendly, really like guided, guided experiences. Um, and we work, we work with them. We still work with them every year doing some, you know, they, they, during disability pride week, will have some art artifact talks, which will be about the Justin Dart um, wheelchair um, and that whole, that whole process. Um, and then they'll, they'll have sensory friendly days at their, at the, um, national constitution center. So I think it's, it, it's, it's a movement it's building. People are yeah, getting yeah. on board. Um, I just wish to me, I just wish that people would, would just think of it as being like inclusive mm -hmm. and instead of like, you know, we, we have these, that DEI. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which I find is just getting overused. What about legislatively? Anything on the radar there that you're involved in? Legislatively, I, last year I was a I worked um, part time for disability equality in education, um, which was a grant um, grant work that was done by an organization. And one of the things that came up through that. Um, was a bill that we worked on with, they worked on with different legislators um, to include disability into the general curriculum. Not, we, and the, the way it was written, it's written completely different than any other legislation in the U.S. Um, because the legislation wasn't about having like, we didn't want a social studies, you know, block. You know, it was, yeah. we, we, we didn't want it just to be like, you were hearing it in social studies. Here's the disability rights movement week that we're going to work on. You know, we also didn't want that the folks who are learning about disability to be the folks who are already living disability, the young folks, they need to learn about it, but everybody needs to learn about it. That's how we become a more inclusive space. So the legislation that went out was that they needed to build curriculum for the general population. Um, and you can do that in art, which I helped, I helped with, um, in math, in science, you know, across the board, there's a way of not like 
actually having like this is disability but like when you're in math class and you're talking about slopes and ramps and arcs and those things what if you said hey the slope of the the accessible ramp to go into the building you know so you're starting to embed the language into to, into the younger into the younger students that now as they start to get older they're starting to hear more and they're more likely to be um engaged in the conversations because it's just part of the normal conversations that are being had. And one of the great things is the work is being done so that um, the disability community is actually being involved in what that um, curriculum looks like. Disability Equality in Education has an entire website that is filled with um, lesson plans for ages K through 12 that is free that anybody can go to and take. Um, that was just kind of a Kickstarter. It's like, here, see what we've done? Like, let's continue to do this. That bill was passed this last year. Um, and so the State Department um, started to do the work. And they actually put a call out to schools across Pennsylvania. At, they're doing a pilot project, which is what, the, way it should, the way it should happen. Um, and they asked the schools it, who wanted to be a part of the pilot project. And there were so many people, so many of them that are that are interested in it, which was amazing to see. Yeah. So this is kind of like they're going to start it. it. Looks like this this following year, you know, school year, it'll go, there's, they have, I think it's two years and I can't remember the exact I think It's like two years. This pilot goes on. They'll be able to course correct and do some things and making sure that it's being done the right way. And then it'll be mandatory for all schools across Pennsylvania to include disability in the education process. Um, through general curriculum. Mm -hmm. wow. Do you have the URL of that, uh, where that, where those materials are available? It's disability equality education.org. I'll put that in the show notes so folks can go have a look there. Yes, it's, it's brilliant. That's, that's <laughs> really phenomenal. Vicki, I wonder, has it been a challenge uh, to address all of the needs of these various disabilities, because there certainly is a distinction between the needs of, say, the blind and visually impaired community versus, uh, you know, someone who's phys got a physical disability mm -hmm. or even intellectual disabilities. But all of that is under disability pride. How do you manage all of those different aspects? So we one thing we wanted to make sure was that this was, it's called Disability Pride Philadelphia. So it needed to be about all disabled people in Philadelphia, <laughs> you know? So the work needed to consist of folks from ac across disability mm -hmm. um, and access is, al is always an ongoing process. It is something that we're I'm that we are dedicated to every single day. Mm -hmm. um, I I let everybody know that if they find something that we're doing that is not accessible to them, to to they can call my cell phone, they can email me. I want to know because yeah. the goal is to make this space feel welcoming, welcoming to everyone. But it is it's. It's a ton of work. Mm -hmm. You have to be committed to it. Um, you have to understand that it's always changing. And that just because this fits for Lisa doesn't mean it's going to fit for everybody else. Right. You know, right. and that's kind of, you have to take it that way. Right. And there are even nuances within the various... Yeah group yep. you know mm -hmm. the, it, blindness is a spectrum um autism is a spectrum you know so right. they're they're even 
with the um, distinction of the disability, even within mm-hmm. that group, there are yes. like other categories or so you do have your plate full (laughs) but but like you said you're committed to the work so that's that's how it gets done yes so so disability is its own spectrum (laughs) of you know and we cross over and the disability community is the most diverse community there is sure absolutely because we take everyone (laughs) you know you're you're born with it, you acquire it, or you grow into it. Mm-hmm. So this is a, this is something that we have to constantly think of constantly. Yeah. You know, I, I want to be corrected. I want to, I want you to tell me if there's something that I can do better that I want us to be, keep learning that these are the things over the last 11 years. Now that I've been doing this work, you know, I'm constantly course correcting and adding my notes and taking notes out and being like, oh, not anymore. This is what we're going to do mm-hmm. and saying, OK, well, this is this. We want to add this to this piece of what we're already doing yeah. just to kind of be as as inclusive as possible. You know, I want everybody to feel like they belong, you know, at our events. What else? needs to be done? What's sort of a call to action to folks out there listening? One thing we're, we're always um, asking folks to like our pages, our social media, and to share out the information that's going out to get feet. We want everybody to come. Mm-hmm. Um, also, if you're looking for volunteer experiences, um, we have, you know, we have lots of different experiences that, that you can take on and there we find we will if you come and you say this is what i can do i'm going to find you that spot to do that mm-hmm. um so that i try to create the volunteer experiences for folks because that is also super important it also gives you pride in what you're doing mm-hmm. um and i think volunteering is a huge piece of being a part of a community and showing up for you know, either your community or another community or just society in general, like <laughs> yeah, volunteering is a thing like that, mm-hmm. you know, I love that a lot of the schools make the students volunteer nowadays because it's just kind of, it's starting to, again, starting to make it just kind of a normal thing and folks yeah. are doing it more and more, especially the younger folks. Mm-hmm. And a lot of companies have uh certain hours that you might even be, I don't know if it's required, but strongly encouraged um, to commit to some sort of volunteer or community service work. Oh, absolutely. There are a few out there that I can tell you my friends at 365 Health Services Mm -hmm. are absolutely amazing at volunteers. Uh, They show up strong um, yeah. at our, at our events, whatever we need them to do. They don't, they don't care what it is. Just, they want to be there. They want to be a part of it. Um, but there are those, those spaces for everybody. And it could be like your organization. Maybe you don't, your organization doesn't want to have a table at the event, but you want to show up. You want to be there. Like mm-hmm. there, there's that space, you know, we're giving folks whatever that space looks like. So you mentioned tables. Uh, Mm -hmm. So folks can, companies can uh, take a table at the event. Is that what kind of uh, investment does that run? Um, So, yeah. So we have, we call them um, sponsored tables. um, And our sponsored tables here um, run anywhere from $500 to $5,000, depending on what you want on top of that. Um, You know, some of the larger organizations, you know, the press and the the social media and the marketing and that kind of stuff. And then there are folks in the, in the community who, um, you know, they just, they like, it's important for them to be here. We want to give them that space. And I also am very, I'm very in, in touch with the fact that a lot of nonprofits like myself work on little tiny budgets (laughs) <laughs> and if there's an organization that says, I really want to be there, I really want to be a part of it, they just need to reach out because I will figure out how they can be involved. 
you know, if, if it's like the National Federation of Blind with Esther mm-hmm. and her group, they're helping us. They're getting they're going to have a table and they're helping us make sure that we have some of our marketing materials in Braille for that day. And so we kind of bartered that system, <laughs> which I love barter. I mean, Vicki, you are just so helping me with the flow of these questions because I was about to swing it back to Esther and have her (laughs) kind of give her pitch for what do you want folks out there to know about this? Uh, What's your sort of call to action? So my call to action is that the blind community of all, all of us, (laughs) wherever we are in Pennsylvania, to actually come out and support and to pretty much um, help out and show the world that we can live the life we really want by being a part of this and being proud in um, our disability. Um, I think that is so important um, to be mentioned about outreach. This is the first big opportunity about doing some outreach and showing the world that we can come together. I think it's very important that we stay together um, as a group and as a community um, because together that's how we we make change um, and that's how we get bill passed. Vicki, you want to give us those dates again and any contact information? Sure. So Disability Pride um, in Philadelphia um, is happening June 5th through the 11th. Um, and just quickly, I wanted to make sure that you, June 5th is the flag raising. We have mm-hmm. a karaoke block party on Tuesday the 6th. Um, we have a microaggressions workshop with cartoon artist Wendy Elliott Vanderveer. Um, June 8th, we're doing our first really exciting exploring nature on the Delaware River Trail. Mm. Um, and then, of course, our very infamous um, meet and mingle that we do um, every year. And then we have the parade. If you want to march in the parade, you want to be a part of the parade. um, It is on June 10th, 11 a.m. at the at City Hall on the North Apron. And we will kick off and march down to the event, which is at 1600 Ben Franklin Parkway. Um, And that'll be all day. Um, probably till five o'clock, mm-hmm. lots of things going on. So that is what is going on in Philly. Again, Lehigh Valley is July 22nd. Pittsburgh is August 25th and 26th. And then the capital region in Harrisburg will be October 7th. And what is your website? My website is Disability Pride PA. Dot org, And you can also reach out to me at Vicki, V-I-C-K-I, at disabilitypridepa.org. Vicki and Esther, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having her. Thanks again to Vicki and Esther for stopping by and giving us all the information on Disability Pride Week, June 5th through the 11th, as well as the Disability Pride Parade on June 10th. And Lisa, you and I will be at our table on June 10th. We will be there in full force supporting, uh, well, representing Keystone, supporting the event and supporting our dear Esther, who will be performing live. Yeah, that's I'm excited to see that. And hopefully we will be close enough to hear that. But it sounds like we may be down the parkway a little bit from that, but hopefully we'll get to see that and get all the uh, greatness of the festivities going on and fingers are crossed for a nice day weather-wise. Yes, exactly. So come out if you're in the Philadelphia area, take note of those other dates and locations in our great state. Maybe support more than one if you're able to get around. Yeah, and I will have all of that information in the show notes in case you forgot the different events around in the Lehigh Valley and Pittsburgh and in Harrisburg. And we would love to know what you think. Are you going to be there? Are you going to go to one of those? Please give us a call, 267-338-4495. You've got up to three minutes. Leave your name in town if you do leave a voicemail. If you're not going to be there or you have some other question or comment or show idea, 
leave that there as well. Again, 267-338-4495. And if you'd like to email us, the address is whitecanesconnect at gmail.com. Lisa, it was a great episode today, and I'm looking forward to June 10th. And uh, I know I'll see you sooner than that at some Keystone chapter meetings. Yes, you shall. Otherwise, June 10th, come out, come one and all. Thanks for listening, everyone. Take care. Thanks, guys. Bye.